So hello everyone um, and welcome to uh, the Junior Lawyers uh, Division's uh, Community Calls. Uh, this week we are with Harry Clark, uh, who is uh, a future trainee solicitor um, uh, at Baker McKenzie. Uh, hello Harry. Hi, thanks for having me. You're, you're welcome. Uh, how are you doing? Very well, actually. It's been a bit of a busy week. I've just finished my teaching for the LPC exams coming up in uh, one or two weeks' time. And then, uh, yeah, like you say, looking forward to starting with Bakers this, this coming September. So have you started your LPC now? Then? Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I've got my stage two exams in a couple of weeks. So oh, um, right. I'm, I'm right towards the tail end. So almost there. One last little push and it'll be over and done with. Great. Uh, well, got some interesting questions about that, actually. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, just before we start, um, the idea with these community calls is that uh, they are um, a place for um, discussion as well as sharing uh, with our members, um, which range from LPC students um, up to uh, five, uh, five years newly qualified uh, in sharing insights into the legal industry um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, uh, and the advice that uh, the guests can bring with them. So really what we want to have a look at um, today with, with you is obviously um, your experiences uh, at the early stages of your career. Um, and obviously a great place to start is, is as a student at the moment, uh, uh, um, as an LPC student, how have you how have you found uh, that in comparison to your undergraduate degree? Yeah, it's certainly different. I think you hear when you're a student anyway, a lot of horror stories about the LPC, what it is and isn't like. Um, and it can be a bit difficult to know what it's all about before you kind of get that first attempt at it. But um, no, I've, re I've actually really enjoyed it. It's been a completely different approach to, um, I think, the kind of traditional approach for LLB students, which is, is very kind of academically focused. And traditionally, you're sort of writing essays and going through academic textbooks whereas the LPC is very practically focused and you are not just knowing the law, but applying it to a client or a kind of mock scenario um, and having to account for their needs and kind of understand the sort of the legal processes in a, a given transaction or a given um, problem um, in a much more sort of practical manner. So it's, it's been different, but it's been a really, really fun and interesting way to learn. And um, uh, yeah, I can, I can see there's a, there's a notable difference in, in how the course is delivered versus the traditional LLB format. Mm. So, obviously, alongside the LPC, you've have quite a formidable uh, presence on on LinkedIn. How have you found balancing balancing those throughout throughout this year? Yeah, it's been it's been um, a, a lot of hard work, but I think all the all the kind of stuff I do on the side with social media or the podcast or anything else is is not work to me it's kind of a it's a hobby and it's yeah. fun um so i think if i'd have been if i was being told to do all that stuff then i can imagine that it would have become very stressful and it would have uh, not been enjoyable but um given that it's just a bit of a passion project it's it's been quite fun to, to kind of have that as a creative outlet um in terms of how i'm balancing that with uh, the lpc it's certainly a, a sort of demand on your time management skills which mm. um i know is also important for for trainees to have with project management so um it's involved a lot of coffee a lot of google calendar um and a lot of yeah, email email sourcing and, and kind of making sure you stay on top of things which historically i've been terrible at so it's been a learning experience for me from uh, from that perspective so how did you get started with the linkedin then um did you always set out with the intention of of of, of where you are today or, or did you start out with it you know as the networking platform that it is <laughs> yeah, no, never. I never, I never kind of had a plan, and I still yeah. don't really. It's just been a case of following um, everything that's been happening and trying to, you know, open up and secure different opportunities as and when they come, and, and making the most of them. Um, in terms of getting started, I was actually looking to delete LinkedIn from my phone just because I was looking for some space to free up on it. Um, and I think, like most people, didn't really see that it as a sort of valuable platform. I didn't really understand it, especially mm. as a student. Um, used it as a sort of digital CV more than anything to just for my own purposes keep track of what I was doing um, and then yeah on that on that day I was looking to delete it it was the time of year when people are very understandably going on social media and posting happy to secure this and happy to have accepted this offer or whatever um, and I just remember being a student not in that position whilst at university and feeling like you need to you know 
get this there and done when you're you know like 18 or whatever and, and kind of secure the rest of your career or just um taking what you see on social media as kind of indicative and representative of you know the the rest of the job market and kind of feeling like you were the only one who didn't get it basically um and made a little post on that sort of basis and it went um it went it went viral it was crazy um and i think from there i just kind of thought okay there's an there's an appetite for students or or at least aspiring lawyers to um get access to resources and advice um for, for sort of entering the profession and i just kind of went in with the the, the sort of motto of well what would i have really wanted as a resource two years ago and i'll mm. do my best to kind of provide that i yeah i never claimed to be an authoritative kind of resource but i certainly think well, i made plenty of mistakes when i was applying for training contracts and trying to learn about law and the, i guess the the less that people who are trying to enter the profession can make those mistakes the better yeah. because ultimately um yeah get sort of access to career services are a bit of a bit of a postcode lottery not everyone's always got um that kind of information on hand all the time and I think that's a really important point to raise is, um, I, you know, I follow you and as a, um, you know, aspiring solicitor myself, your content has been incredibly helpful in terms of um, getting to grips with things that I perhaps wouldn't have known about, you know, otherwise. And I think a really one of those really important things is commercial awareness. Mm -hmm. um, so I remember a couple of months ago, I think it was before Christmas, you released a very helpful sort of everything you need to know about commercial awareness guide. Mm -hmm. um, and at the time I was um, as part of the uh, Aspiring Sisters um, like commercial awareness competition. And it helped a great deal in, in really just sort of solidifying the importance between, you know, external and internal commercial awareness um mm. your your guide um and i think you know it's great that that content is now being pushed out um on on linkedin by you know people like yourselves who really are just doing it um as you know as a hobby um but what what it really is doing is helping to make sure that those people who are you know perhaps don't have that same access to um uh, to to the um sorry to the uh, pre, uh to the profession uh mm -hmm. are not disadvantaged by you know by where they went to university or um or whatnot but coming off mm -hmm. of the back of that the the the, the question uh, that i have for you is you know if you were to look back now um and to give yourself some tips for people um, who may be still applying for training contracts at the moment um, or starting to apply again in September, what would you like to have said to yourself at that stage? <laughs> yeah, I might need a, a few hours to rattle off everything, but um, <laughs> there, were, there, were, there were certainly a few mistakes which were, I guess, more prominent than others. And from, and from what I can tell, speaking to students who were in my cohort or just through reading applications, I think it's one that's quite consistent kind of across, across the board. Um, I think one of what you know, one of the main things that I had tried to change. I did three rounds of sort of application cycles, um, and you know, between my second and third rounds, my experience or my academics and the kind of things I was putting into the application didn't change a lot, in all honesty. Um, and what, but what did change was kind of my my writing style and my approach to sort of researching the firms. So, for example, in my in my sort of second round applications, a a really common mistake I made was. Was, was simply not tailoring my my application to the firm and what what that meant was i was you know getting a definition of a, of a type of firm that i would like to work for say commercial firm with some kind of international element based in london um and i'd kind of stopped there thinking that that's narrow enough for the purposes of an application um but of course if you if you know a lot about the depression and the markets you realize that that definition alone fits like at least 20 firms in london if not yeah um, so, you know, when a recruiter is reading it, they're, they're getting the impression that you like commercial law and that you, you know, like the international element, you might have good evidence of doing that, but you're not fundamentally addressing that kind of why here, why this firm kind of question. So I certainly tried to sort of tailor my application by getting narrow enough in my kind of reasoning and my argumentation, which meant that I could, um, you know, I, I couldn't just swap out the name of the firm and the application still makes sense. Um, I was talking about specific initiatives that the firm was running or, um, 
deals they might have done referencing their sort of tier practice strengths in the legal 100 or something like that. Those are all examples of where you're relating information sort of specifically to the firm. So tailoring and getting specific is, is sort of one of the biggest ones. Um, and then the second was just writing style. And I think this is something I always struggled with at university, um, sort of needing to signpost resources if, if, or signpost throughout an essay, for example, when you're sort of giving your resources and leading the reader through a conversation. Um, it was a similar sort of principle when it came to actually writing applications. And one mistake that I was really guilty of, and, and I've seen a few examples of this from sort of mentoring others, is um, trying to say too much in one sentence and just kind of getting really listy and trying to just sort of throw out all your experiences on the paper and kind of hope it sticks or just sort of trying to think that you need to mention as many different things to a recruiter as possible to show your experience whereas in reality you're probably better off narrowing it down in terms of the number of things you're saying but actually utilizing them and, and being quite specific and giving a more fuller, fuller context behind how you kind of went above and beyond your responsibilities for example as a way to really kind of make them useful so um, yeah, probably those two together were the, cool. those are the biggest ones that I think I, I would give to myself um, going back on, uh, on my applications. Yeah, no, I think that's great because a, a, a thing that you see a lot, I suppose, in, uh, is, is people just what I call fact dumping um, mm -hmm. or just putting in statistics that do not reflect your motivations for applying for that firm mm. um and if i was to sort of give myself you know the similar tips to so i i you know i've been applying for for two two cycles now mm -hmm. if i was to give myself the similar tips it would be to first really have a think about you know why it is that you are applying for those for those firms and to really have a clear understanding of what it is that you envision yourself doing mm -hmm um in you know in a few years time and and when you have that motivation that is your focal point and any facts or anything that you add to it um are only to emphasize that point and i think that would be you know the the, the thing that i would take away that i would have want to have told myself when i was starting out and it, you know yeah. it's really interesting that that is you know quite reflective of you as well in it's why I think that it's so important that we have these platforms, you know, like LinkedIn and also what the junior lawyers division and, uh, and whatnot are doing is to make sure that we are helping people get uh, access to the profession um, and are setting off on the right foot. Um, yeah, that, yeah, that point about fact dumping is, is, is one that not just that I've kind of witnessed, but whenever I've spoken to recruiters or ex-recruiters here on the podcast or just generally in conversation they say that's one of the biggest kind of gripes they have with an application when a candidate is is answering the question of say who is this firm perfectly but that's not the question that's being asked yeah. it's why are you applying here so you know, telling telling the firm information that they will know better than anyone that you know they have 20 offices in however many countries or their global revenue was x is is great for demonstrating you understand who they are but from their perspective it doesn't help them understand why you're you're reaching out and applying to them so yeah that's a re that's a really important point and echoes what i've heard from recruiters as well mm. so as we move forward now um into this new normal um <laughs> i've been having a a think really about what social me social media's um impact will be going for you know going forward and in, in my view, the way that the recruitment process is going to change is going to be a lot more heavily reliant on, on what is sort of can be put out on, on, on social media um, and people's sort of presence on there. Um, you see it a lot with firms at the moment who are, um, you know, really upping their sort of Instagram game so that they know that people um so people can get a different insight into the firm it would be interesting to know what your sort of thoughts are about how you see the future of you know the recruitment process going obviously you you know you know you're no expert but it would be interesting <laughs> to see you know what you think about how those two might coincide in the future yeah i mean i i think i we've slowly started to see this transition i think i was probably at the tail end of i guess you would call traditional ways of advertising and marketing which is uh -huh. through 
um, you know, through print, through leaflets, through law fairs, through attending universities and lectures versus what you just described as a result of COVID kind of forcing that, which is this kind of digital presence. Um, mm. I guess my only real comment would be is it's, it's, and I, you know, I think, I think law fairs are incredibly useful um, because you get that one-to-one -one discussion with a firm and they, they, will, they will be there to stay. But I think what's always kind of, uh, baffled me is is the is the way that a lot of a lot of firms almost under appreciate or undervalue these these, these digital forms of marketing and, and reaching out via you know social networks or anything else. I think um, you know inherently no student really wants to sit in a lecture hall for an hour or two and hear a presentation about a firm <laughs> just talking away. It's a very kind of unfriendly student unfriendly should we say um, method of communication. Oh. Whereas, you know, I think I think a lot of students in their own personal lives would admit that. You know, they might be on LinkedIn again. That's not a hugely student-friendly platform, but they're almost gonna, certainly going to be on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and everything else. So, um, and and the great thing about these platforms is you can still get a degree of kind of interconnectedness and, and interaction, like you can with a law fair. You know, you can do Q and A's, you can do live streams, you can do webinars, podcasts. Um, these are all ways of kind of diversifying the way that, that firms are advertising and um, making it feel a bit more a, a, sort of a personal as well if it, is, if it is some kind of live event so i think that's certainly one reason why we've seen so many webinars and live streams and everything else going yeah. on at the moment in, in covid and um, in terms of it's here to stay like i said i think i think law fairs are, are, are certainly useful but you know mm. there are firms who even before covid said that they're not going to do any because admittedly from their perspective you know it's it's quite costly to send people all over the uk and do these you know huge milk round promotional marketing runs and i think um this kind of experiment that, that covid has brought upon us with with everyone staying at home is they're going to see okay well can we get a similar or even better effect by um not necessarily not doing those in-person things but perhaps just shifting some of our focus to this online space as well um what the answer will be to that i don't know but it's been it's been really interesting to see at least from um, my perspective interacting with students the number of people who are willing to learn and upskill and engage from home despite everything that's going on um and i think that for the most part, a lot of those kind of sentiments and attitudes to, to engaging digitally will, will remain um, after the pandemic is mm. over, whatever that means. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and, and one other thing about um, social media is, is that it's a platform for people to sort of really sell, you know, their unique selling points. And, and, that, and the same goes for the firms as well. And, uh, and that's something that I think will... We'll, we, we will see more of is because something that so many people have struggled with in 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 the recruitment processes is different uh, you know differing those firms from each other mm. and one of the ways that social media might be able to you know really emphasize that is by having someone sit in front of the camera and be themselves you know you mm -hmm. are able to get that better insight into into what that firm might like might be and the same goes for you know a lot of the people who are really starting to up and understand that that their social media presence um is you know certainly a way that they can really put across and really understand themselves in terms of what they can bring to the law firm Mm. um so you know whether they are working part-time or full-time or studying or you know they've done x y and z um it really helps to crystallize i think on when you have to put it down um on on a social media platform to then translate you know into the recruitment process so yeah yeah i i agree that you know social media is going to sort of be changing the way that the recruitment process works um but yeah obviously depending on what happens with with everything else um you know it, it, it's not going to entirely replace the the benefits mm -hmm. of of having those in-person conversations yeah. um at a law firm um they that really covers all the questions um i have it's been really interesting to you know really discuss the application process and uh, and the social media element of it um, we do have a few guests um, with us um, today and I would like to invite them to uh, ask any questions that they have um, from you, particularly um, based on your experiences as a current LPC student, as someone who has been through the recruitment process um, or, any, or really just any general questions that they might have um, if they do have them. Um, the chat uh, function is 
open um, for those with us today. Um, so just see if anyone would like to ask a question. Do, 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 do. do have one in the chat. So we have one from um, Athene who would like to ask, uh, how would you recommend framing your experiences uh, in the best way to come across to law firms well? Yeah, good question. Um, and again, echoing from conversations I've had with recruiters and ex-recruiters, um, and I think this, is, this kind of touches on a, a point of the question he's making, um, is that candidates don't always utilise experiences, and especially those that they might not consider are relevant to the firm or position they're applying to. So those, those quote-unquote traditional non-legal experiences like retail or any other kind of work experience that you've done. Um, in terms of framing it, I think a mistake that I certainly made and that I've, I've sort of seen when, when mentoring people is people get very descriptive about what the job was. So, you know, this is what my, you know, almost saying this is what my manager told me what to do. This, these are my responsibilities. Mm. Um, and I think where possible, you want to try to give an example of how you've kind of given your 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 own personal impact on a situation. So um, you often hear staff are kind of competency questions, but I think if you can take a similar-ish approach to describing your experiences, you should be able to say through, you know, your experiences of what you've done at there, you know, where you were you responsible for launching a particular project? Did you increase sales by a certain percentage when working retail? Did you win certain awards? Um, these are all examples of where you're saying, you know, it wasn't just my job to do X, Y, Z, but I went above and beyond that by doing ABC. Um, because then a, a, a recruiter will understand not only that you just do what you're told, but also you can go above and beyond and, and kind of exceed expectations and really make that personal impact as well. So um, I think when it comes to actually describing them, that's, that's certainly a better way to approach it than just being descriptive. Um, and I think when it comes to sort of framing your experiences, I think um, people draw a lot of a distinction between legal and non-legal experience. And I think like I hinted at the beginning of my answer, um, that non-legal experience can be just as valuable as legal stuff um, in terms of evidence that you're transferable skills, your ability to you know, handle positions of responsibility, work well within a team and so on. Um, I remember in my Baker's interview, we, we talked about basketball for like 20 minutes in my partner interview. And it just kind of, it kind of caught me a bit off guard because I thought that I was going to have to go there and be this robotic lawyer that knew all the law and kind of had to be particularly commercial all the time. When in reality, at least for a lot of firms, they want someone who's going to fit there culturally as well as, you know, legally in terms of their ability to know the law and, and fix problems. So um, I think your experiences should hopefully kind of demonstrate to a recruiter, obviously what you did, um, also how you went above and beyond it where you can, and then, and then kind of finally a bit of, bit of personality and kind of showing the recruiter you've got that breadth of experience or that you've, you've been involved in different projects. Um, I think holistically, if you can describe that, they get a good idea of not just what you can do, but a bit more about who you are as well in, in terms of your application. Uh, I, I haven't got much to say on basketball, but I, I, I did watch The uh, the Last Dance recently. Have you, have you watched <laughs> that series? I need to. I need to. I'm a, big, I'm a big Jordan fan, so I, I don't know why I haven't yet. But yeah, I need to. It was my first sort of real experience of the you know the basketball world, but it was uh, really interesting actually. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it's definitely one I would uh, recommend you watching. And we have a question from uh, Martin who wants to ask: um, Have either yourself or me uh, got any stories about um, how the uh, junior lawyers division or local uh, junior lawyers groups um, have had a positive impact on their roots into law. So, I mean, for me, um, uh, so I'm part of the JLD uh, executive committee, which is um, the sort of broad um, committee that uh, uh, sits within the, in the, in the law society, protecting and um, ensuring the interests of, of the junior lawyers. Um, it was something that I got involved in um, in um, October of last year. And what it's really helped me with um, is building uh, my sort of connections um, and understanding the importance of, of sharing experiences. Um, from people who are um, also going through the application process and people who have been through it. Just being able to be in um, uh, forums and whatnot where we're able to discuss that and and take away conversations where you think, yeah, you know, this is something that I could do um, myself um, has been a real, you know, 
real impact on 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 just how much I enjoy you know being part of this legal legal profession um it, it's that networking that networking element um have you had any sort of experience yourself with with the junior lawyers division uh in the past yeah no not with not with JLD specifically mm. that's only been quite recent um yeah. but I think I think for in terms of kind of local groups and societies Absolutely, and things yeah. obviously law society at university was a big one yeah. and in hindsight saying I probably wish I'd got stuck in with even more at university mm. but kind of being able to do you know, meet those firms and take part in the events they were running was a really good way to like you said um you know, build your connections and so learn a little bit more about law and then i think when i was even younger when i was about 16 um i was obviously didn't know anything about law and um there were a lot of kind of local law competitions like mooting events um and different ways to outreach and learn and speak to lawyers um so they were really beneficial to me as well. Um, so I think I think events that are specifically geared towards more more junior lawyers are obviously really beneficial if you if you are aspiring or currently practicing in a junior capacity because um, you know everyone is is there is aware of that and everyone will have been through somewhat of a similar experience when it comes to going through the application process if they're if they're kind of practicing today and it's a great opportunity to yeah like you said Callum to, to ask questions and to, and to meet new people. So um, yeah, I think I think it's I think it's nothing but a bonus and, and of help to help your route into law great and um, just two uh, more quick questions from um <laughs> ella and ben um ella asks um do, uh, do you recommend showing not telling um in applications um eg i worked um in a team versus i gained teamwork skills yeah good question um i think i think whenever i'm proofreading an answer or trying to understand a kind of candidate skill set or motivations um it's an it's an over reliance on the second one so showing and saying i have these skills i have x um mm. which to me makes me makes me go okay i i understand that you, you know i worked in a shop therefore i have good communication skills but i think you need to give a little bit of that evidence to help support it so it's, it's a balancing act between the two um i think if you were going to go with just one i guess i'd probably go with the first one because hopefully the, the reader can kind of infer from the fact that you've done all these team-based things that you develop these skills but i think you need an element of both and i certainly think kind of relying on the second example of saying i gained this skill doing x i gained this skill doing y can mm. not only make your uh, application a little bit repetitive but also the, the 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 person reading it will want to go okay i i understand you've claimed that you have built these skills but i need i need to see evidence of or, or an example of when you've done that um yeah. if not in your application then it certainly is at, at any industry via a, a kind of standard competency based yeah. question or something like that I think just to add to that, um, what's really helped me is not seeing it as show, not tell, but seeing it as show and tell. Um, mm -hmm. So showing just being, you know, saying something simple like I worked in a team, but then, you know, uh, sorry, telling, saying, I, uh, you know, I, I worked in the team, but then also showing what you learn from that. Um, and then that sort of, comes into that balancing act that you you were talking about so maybe that's that's one way to to look at it um lastly from uh ben um is how do i approach people on uh linkedin um such as to ask about the uh culture um how specific uh should should he be mm. it's funny you mentioned that i actually made a post on this i think about two days ago um and this was something that i kind of struggled with at first i think when i started writing publicly back in uh, almost a year ago exactly i didn't leave the house for any kind of professional context or to network in any way for about for about three or four months you know, everything i was doing was digitally mm. um and i think that the ways that you can kind of improve your success rate is to well before you reach out i think do some reading about that person understand what it is they, they kind of post content about or what it is they're into try to understand their background and try to identify a kind of hook or a, a sort of touch touch base point that you can you can chat with them so you know they might have posted an interesting article on something that you're really interested in or they might have um studied at the same university as you or had an experience that you really want to learn more about i think find that initial point of contact which demonstrates you've done a bit of reading and, you know, and you're not just kind of going alphabetically down your the list mm, of re recommended yeah. people and just hitting them up one by one um obviously personalize your connection requests if we're talking linkedin specifically it really helps them stand out in in the kind of network notifications bit um and just give a quick quick brief you know short introduction and say hi i'm ben for example i'm a i'm a student or i'm this um really saw you mentioned this recently looking forward to 
asking more about it, would it be possible to reach out with you so we can have a chat? Um, and then, yeah, following up uh, as much as you can. So obviously some people will just simply be too busy, especially lawyers. They're very busy people. Um, but if you are successful, follow up with it and, and do it while it's fresh in the memory and keep, and keep whatever it is you're talking about, not, you know, relatively narrow and not too kind of broad you know i think if if uh, everyone's kind of been here from a, a you know non-professional sort of context and you get a text from your friend that's like 20 20 lines long and you're like oh god okay i'll read that later do that later i don't want to deal with that right now and i think mm. that there's a similar principle when it comes to reaching out for a professional kind of networking reasons yeah. you know d- don't bombard the, the person with 30 questions about you know every every angle i think keep it relatively short keep it specific um and keep it personal you know don't ask something which is easily googleable and and, mm. and and try to find their own personal opinion and then hopefully at the end of that of that of that kind of reach out of that connection um you know ask them to if there's anyone else they'd recommend you talk to if there's anyone else they could refer you to to talk about a specific area of law that's what i did um because that meant that you know if, if i sent out 10 you know potential outreaches and only got one back um if i followed up on that one person they might yeah. introduce me to two or three other people and you kind of consider and generally, if you've got a referral, you know, if someone said, oh, I was recently speaking to X, they recommended I get in touch with you, then they might be more likely to, to reach out. Um, and then, yeah, it's just an exponential process of, of kind of following up on those, trying to get some more referrals towards the end and, and kind of expanding your network that way. Um, and that's a great way to, to learn more about the culture of the firm, for example, is, is speaking to future or currently practicing trainees and junior lawyers. They're generally the ones who will have probably have a little bit more time than the partners and be able to give you a bit more of a um, personal and relatable answer to, to your current position um, and take part in the you know the abundance of webinars and live streams and everything else that's going on right now because I think yeah. you know given everything that's going on firms have have never really been as transparent or as open mm. as they are on social media currently and they are quite literally you know giving away access to you know different areas of law different Absolutely. topics that they want to talk about and, and the firm generally so um, yeah I hope that helps yeah no that's fantastic um have run over a little bit but uh, i will just say thank you so much for uh for joining us today both harry and and our guests i um, hope you found it useful um this will be up on youtube and uh spotify as well um so uh yes thank you very much harry um it's great to speak to you um and best of luck um with everything and with your exams coming up as well thanks so much for having me it was an absolute pleasure Great. Thanks then, Harry. Cheers.